Today our speaker is Tom Hepner. Tom is a member of our Board of Trustees. He's a former president of our board. Uh, he is also a former uh, chair of the National Membership Society of the American Ethical Union, of which we are, the Chicago Society is the second oldest society. It is one of about 25 other ethical societies uh, in the United States. We're also part of a national movement. Thank you, Sue. Good morning. Welcome to the Ethical Humanist Society. Um, it is my great treat to talk about two things. Um, the origins of ethical humanism, as we are today. Um, and um, this is an appropriate time, perhaps, to do that. Um, this week, I became 68 years old. That happens to be uh, just double the age of um, what is called the ethical culture movement. Uh, some 136 years ago, um, the ethical culture movement officially started. Um, and you can talk about those things over a great history, but I would like to, uh, as we, I do when I teach and uh, speak about various other things in medicine, uh, recognize that a case study is always the best way to start on teaching anything and talking about anything because it makes it real to you uh, because things that happened so far back it's hard to imagine where we've come in in this time so I'll talk a little bit about my personal journey uh, and um, I would recognize that um, I think I've come some significant distance and the world has certainly changed in a little bit uh, there are images, of course, of what the world is like. I'd suggest that all of us, um, or the vast majority of us, go through some kind of an ethical journey where we make choices or things just happen that change the way we do things rather dramatically. Uh, and uh, you see represented here uh, some images from uh, Dante's Inferno. There were representations. I would have grown up with a good education. I would have grown up and knowing about... Um, these various levels of hell that might have existed in somebody's imagination and, and certainly uh, what could be more real than those incredible structures that are in the great paintings or more recently the possibility that in fact there is beauty and love uh, that might uh, prevail in various other ways. But um, in order to know where we've come to, we need to know where we started out. So I just start out with something about where I started out. Uh, you may recognize something called the Our Father. It reads something like, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. I would have learned that when I was four or five years old, shortly after I learned how to speak. Um, within a short time later, I would have learned something a little bit more uh, elaborate, the Apostles' Creed, which is the prayer of faith in the teachings of Jesus and his church. Uh, and it indicated your level of commitment. I believe in, Almighty God, in God, God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again, ascended to heaven, and is seated at the right, seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. That's an enormous amount of history as well as commitment. Most of it you might not see around as you walk around every day, either in this building or even out in the outside. But I do, of all of that, and, and most of it sounds very different to me than it did when I was 5, 6, or 10, or 20. But uh, there are a couple of things that I would ask you to pay a little bit attention to uh, beyond those remarkable supernatural su su suggestions and, and history is, um, is one term, forgiveness of sins. And I would just look forward as we develop how we think about and what I think about today of how I live is whether we have a process because as you'll see and you may very well know that every religious tradition has some way of acknowledging fault 
and an organized way of forgiveness. And I would just ask you to reflect on your most recent act of forgiveness. Does it happen? Because I've heard people say that we have lost that capability. We don't incorporate it within it within our practices. So I would just leave that as one small item of this rather remarkable statement here. But then I'll go on to what is um, essentially what you would see in the catechism from the time you start uh, school uh, at about five, six years of age and would go to release time at 2 o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon in New York City where I grew up. Um, and that is, uh, I am the Lord thy God. They shall have no strange gods before me. They shall not, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember to keep holy Sabbath day. All, of course, supernatural issues um, that we could elaborate on, but I won't. Uh, and then rather some rather direct, um, honor thy father and mother. And I'm glad to see my son here to know about this. Uh, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Bear fault witness against thy neighbor. Covet thy neighbor's wife. Covet thy... It was not till I was in my teens that I knew what it meant to covet. So it took me a while to really appreciate what I was not doing. Um, um, but it was with that background, and I should say I was raised in a, uh, a family. Uh, my mom um, was Catholic, and my dad converted to Catholicism from um, Episcopalian. He was an Episcopalian as he grew up. He converted, and uh, instead of going into the ministry, and he was thinking going into the ministry in the Episcopalian faith, uh, he converted to marry my mom, and they got married in the Catholic Church. But as a result of this background, uh, some uh, about seven or eight uh, years of age, uh, you saw here uh, a young boy. I'm not, I'm not the uh, one in stone. I'm the one with the little flower over here. And um, these are the image. This was out in front of Corpus Christi Church, my local church, at which I would have received my first Holy Communion. So I was a practicing Catholic as my whole family. I'm one of seven. I'm the third of seven children. Um, and um, after this time, I would uh, practice in Catholic would be uh, just the kind of words that you saw in those previous prayers would be the kinds of things that we would say on a regular basis, uh, obviously every Sunday. Um, I would go to church every Sunday and do those things. And most of those things that you saw in the Ten Commandments, other than when I had to go to confession and confess for doing those things that I wasn't supposed to do, I didn't do most of those things. So I, I thought I was good, uh, and I really did feel I was very good. Um, and then I went on to school uh, a little bit later, and I was a good student, so I went to Stuyvesant High School in New York, which is one of the better high schools in the city, uh, and from there on to City College and studied psychology. And psychology is one of those interesting sciences that has some hard features and some, some deep features. Uh, and psychology... Um, was uh, interesting enough that I wanted to know something about the brain and about behavior. And uh, what we're talking about here is how we behave, of course, um, and how we might want to behave and what values we bring to bear on how we behave. Uh, I did well enough in school that I, I in college, that I was uh, offered a scholarship to go up to Canada, which I did. And uh, I was warmly welcomed by the Canadians. Um, uh, this is um, uh, Joanne, who I've come to know very well, and you may have gotten to know. Uh, they were very warm. In fact, they say Canada is cold, but in fact, there's a summer up there just as there is here. And, but the Canadians are so warm that they let their hair down, give you a glass of wine. They might hold on to their own while they give you plenty of wine to follow up. And one thing leads to another, and, and we were married. But we were not married in the Catholic Church. Joanne grew up as a Protestant in one of those many sects of Protestantism in Canada, and she will elaborate on this for me. I'll call her up shortly. Um, and I want any of your input here and in, in direction. But um, that step to get married in, in a non-Catholic church, um, it was not her church, and it was not my church. We were looking for somebody who would marry us. And we could not find somebody who would marry us in Canada because all marriages essentially took place under the auspices of one religion or another. And um, our dear friend who was a minister and said, I couldn't possibly marry you because I would lose my faith if I, I put you two together in a marriage. So um, marriage is obviously a, a turning point for a number of people. It was not a turning point for us in terms of thinking about a new religion. We were not making big decisions, but we did find somebody who said, I'll marry you next week. So we sent a note to our, my folks and Joanne's folks and said, we're getting married next week. Come join us. 
and they did, one from, some from Florida, some from uh, New York, and uh, we got married. And one thing leads to another, and uh, this is my first son, uh, uh, and when he was a little, bit, a little boy, up in Canada on the farm that Joanne grew up on. And Joanne is really the sto start of this story, because, of course, I went up to Canada, and moving away from home is one of the ways you change who you are. Uh, rather dramatically, and it really was the first, I traveled a little bit, but hardly ever, till I went up to graduate school in Canada, and we met new people, and I met Joanne, and we became married and had a child, and it was somewhere in that time, religion was never, and, and the behaviors we were choosing seemed to happen spontaneously, you're not, you were not making big decisions, or what, what kinds of decisions to make, um, you just do those things that make sense given whatever your backgrounds are, and they were always consistent, we were not wrestling with that. But somewhere right about that time when, um, shortly after we were married, and about the time when we had our first son, a search started. And Joanne really started this search. I was a very studious person. I was in the laboratory most of the time. But she would read much, and I would read all the textbooks and, and scientific articles. Joanne would read much beyond that. And one of the things she read is the Humanist magazine. If you don't know it, you should know about it. It has a remarkable amount of information. Uh, and it had information about a variety of other, of gather, in addition to articles about ideas, there are indication of locations. Well before the internet and various uh, Facebook and Meetup and LinkedIn, uh, you could find what was going on in the Humanist magazine. And among the things that apparently were uh, listed near the back of the book, um, were, uh, back of the magazine, were uh, indications of the Unitarian churches and ethical culture societies. And we were in Canada, and then we were just moving to a postdoctoral fellowship in New York. So we did, at that time, explore some Unitarian churches uh, because they made some sense to us because we had read some of these articles in the, mag in the mag Humanist magazine. And I'll give you some flavor of some of those uh, in a moment. Uh, but that brought us to go and sample some of those uh, Unitarian churches. And because we moved to New York, uh, we happened to sample, in the same vein, the Ethical Culture Society of Queens. And um, I, we were living in Queens at the time where I grew up and my family still lives. So it, it made sense just to explore this. And we got to meet people and ideas that made sense. And I'd suggest that people and ideas have to come together to make sense that make you stay. And uh, I, I continue to emphasize that. People and ideas that feel close to you intellectually and, and personally. That people you want to spend your time with. Um, so let me turn then to um, this notion of ethical culture. Ethical culture, um, when I say the origins of ethical humanism, um, the, the name that was initially uh, given to this movement, uh, which was called a movement, was um, ethical culture. And a name that you should know is Felix Adler. Felix Adler was the founder of ethical culture, and we'll talk about it a little bit. And it came out of some interesting mix of ideas of um, that were in the late 1800s that were percolating in ways that they do now in various parts of the world that we're very impressed by. These notions of democracy and reason and science. And um, these are commonplace terms for us now. Uh, but they were not necessarily prevalent, and, and the awareness and the, and the impact on them. And these other names of people, Copernicus and Darwin and Kant and Paine and Emerson, um, a few of those names, we all know something about those names, but it's hard to appreciate what they might have meant. Think about this notion that Copernicus introduced, this notion that, uh, and, and it goes back to some of the earlier astronomers, and this notion that we are not the center of everything, this world is not the center of everything, this earth, that in fact this notion that we are one of those planets that revolves around something else that's much bigger, and in fact that's only part of something that's much bigger, it changes the shift from we, this world is the center of everything that went on, Obviously, create, the creation story suggested that this was the beginning. The earth was created, you know, the first, seven, the first day or two, the earth was created, and there were various other steps that took place. Copernicus opened up a physical explanation for something that didn't fit very well with some concepts. Uh, and, um, and it flipped not just that sense of everything is centered here, but it's actually ended up being interpreted 
as something else, and that is that not all power may come from one source um, if that, th some of those stories didn't make such, so much sense. Well, Darwin, of course, came up with some other stories that also didn't make so much sense when in the context of some of the words that I read to you earlier in prayers that suggested that um, man, in fact, may have evolved in some interesting way from some other beings uh, that um, over a very long period of time. And it, it obviously it challenges some of the creation stories. Uh, and then there were a number of other, other individuals. Um, and I just mentioned, uh, look at those names. We'll see the, uh, some evidence of them a little bit later. But it was in that time that, that Thomas Paine and, and Ralph Waldo Emerson, who, who became a Unitarian minister. And I will comment on, just as we had searched a little bit for Unitarianism and looked at ethical culture, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson um, was initially a Unitarian minister, and then he left the ministry and went on to work on other things. But I'm going to come then to Felix Adler, who um, has these terms that we'll talk about that you may have heard about in the past. This notion of deed has put great emphasis. And uh, the issue is, is what you do and how you live your life and human worth. Um, the notion of, of uh, action being more important than, that is, deed is more important than what you believe was something that is, uh, as you'll see, it, it turns out to be a, a remarkable statement that, that um, met with a tremendous resistance. And the other one was of human worth. And it, it, the human, notion of human worth came out of these, some of these scientific issues and some of the philosophical issues. The notion that an individual, every single individual has value and worth and it's not that everything is derived either from something supernatural or from the king who pow had power over everything and every peon had no worth whatever other than as serving, serving the master. Uh, and Felix Adler was the starter in interesting ways. He was born in uh, 1850 and he lived till about 1933. He was uh, considered a professor. Uh, a rationalist, a religious leader, a social reformer and social reform turns out to be what he did most of the time. But he talked about the background of why he was so engaged in social reform. The things that you would call civics, the things that you think our government should be doing, he thought they were not being done, whether you feel they're not being done now, uh, 130, 40 years ago, he felt they were not being done in New York City. Um, and just as many other religions evolved out of um, success, developed successors, Obviously, Judaism evolved in, in selective ways into Christianity and a variety of other Protestant groups that evolved out of, out of Catholicism, an early Catholicism and a variety of other. There was some notion that some aspect of, of Jewish culture was sustained by his work, but in fact, there was something else, and it's the actual foundation of the ethical culture movement. Um, he wrote... Um, he, he was a professor early on at Cornell and then came down to Columbia uh, and spent much of his life in New York at Columbia. And he was the author of a variety of books. And you look at the names and they give you some flavor of where he was coming from and the words that he used, creed and deed, moral instruction of children, the religion of duty. Uh, he was a slave master. It was not to something on high but from uh, the need that he perceived that had to be done, we have a responsibility. Uh, how many of you live with the notion of uh, an ethical imperative? There are things that you must do, uh, uh, and that's that what's make that make life meaningful. Um, he had uh, several of those that came from the need to make the world a better place. Um, the ethical philosophy of life, spiritual ideal. Uh, he was born in Germany, son of a rabbi who was a reformed Jew, uh, Jew. And as a result, at least Adler was aware of the notion of a religion that can make changes, That uh, being a reformed Jew. The family m uh, migrated to the uh, US uh, when uh, Felix was about six. So his dad could be the head of a major um, temple in New York City on the east side, upper, upper east side, if you know New York. Uh, they didn't think he'd make, make amount to much, but he did go to Columbia, and he did well. He graduated, and he went on to uh, Heidelberg, essentially to become a rabbi to replace his dad when his dad retired. And in Germany, he was influenced by a few ideas. And we've referred to Kant, and I'm no philosopher, but uh, I get all my information either from um, Wikipedia, Google, or um, various other sources, and that's where half of this comes from in the beginning. Um, the notion 
that came out of these kinds of studies, that you cannot prove or disprove the existence of a deity or of an immortality. Deities and immortalities, that was a big part of all many religions. But also, a very interesting concept that morality could be established independently of theology, which is a radical notion. I've been told by persons who are close to me that how could you know what to do if you don't believe in God? It was, it's, it's a, some people think that's how would you ever know what to do and how would you make the right choices? Um, when he came back to Germany, uh, from Germany, uh, he was asked to give a t uh, uh, his, his opening talk at, the, uh, uh, at his dad's temple. And his sermon was the Judaism of the future. So he was thinking of Judaism. And he shocked the congregation. He didn't mention God once. And um, he had this notion of Judaism as universal religion of morality for all mankind. It was his first and last sermon at his dad's temple. It was clear that he, now his dad was, was very disappointed and um, initially they were somewhat uh, estranged. But I can tell you that that, that changed and they became close. Um, and this is the founding address that he gave uh, two years later uh, when he was asked, he, he, after he, he gave that address and he was not going to be the rabbi, he went off to Cornell to teach and he taught um, Hebrew and Oriental studies. And, um, and then a couple of years later, he was called back down by the people, half the people in, the, in his dad's uh, congregation thought this was a remarkable notion. They wanted to pursue it. They brought him down and he gave an opening address when he came back down to New York in 76. Um, he said there'll be simple ceremonies Essentially, these are his words, uh, devoid of all ceremony and formalism. It's a lecture, and to make them pleasing, we'll have music. So we've had music, a lecture. We tend not to stop at that point. We usually engage the audience as well, because that didn't happen in those days. He proposed to entirely exclude prayer and all form of ritual, and he did not want to interfere with other people believing in what they believe. That is the faith. He did not feel the need to put down other religions. Early on, this is his statement. He wants to find much more common ground, as you'll see. To occupy the common ground we may all meet, believers and unbelievers, for the purposes that are lofty and unquestioned by all. So his point was that believe what you want. We all have work to do. Let's do it together, and many other points along the way. The freedom of thought is sacred right for every individual man. Diversity will continue to increase and with progress and refinement and differentiation of the human intellect. So he recognized that we're going to be in transitions indefinitely and hopefully we would do a better job at taking care of whatever it is we're going to take care of. He made this term, used this term, diversity in the creed, believe what you want, but unanimity in the deed, work together, and suggested that this is a practical religion. And it did not rely on a theology at all. He had no theology that he promoted. I said, this is a common ground, ground where we may all grasp hands as brothers united in mankind's common causes. He saw the common causes were self-evident to everybody who looked around. We, of course, see them when we hear the news or we look in our neighborhoods um, or if you look any further. Um, as he said early on, the prophets have said, um, the Hebrew prophet said to serve Jehovah, make your hearts pure and clean your hands from corruption. In his time, in the, in the mid-1800s, late-1800s, he felt that uh, New York had highly corrupt uh, both uh, business as well as government. And it was, uh, he suggests to help the suffering, to raise the oppressed. Jesus also said he came to comfort the weary and, heavy, and, and, uh, and heavy laden. And the philosophers also say the true service of religion is the uns unselfish service of the common wheel. There is no difference among all of them. And you will see that theme evolving very strongly within ethical culture and as we'll introduce humanism itself and how ethical culture and humanism come together, they make this assertion. Um, although there are lots of differences in how you come to believe things, what you think you might do here in the time that you have might actually have, we may have a great consensus. We can wrestle about lots of individual issues, but there's a remarkable consensus on what we might want to do. 
And he did have these, these great hopes in this very early day of laying a foundation of a, an edifice that might last forever. Um, and, but he, he suggested it calls for action. He was a true idealist and wanted people to work together for cooperative activity. Um, it became clear he was not going to be the rabbi. He went up to Cornell. Uh, interestingly, he went up to Cornell, and universities were not very different then than they are now. Apparently, some of his uh, father's colleagues at the uh, uh, temple had given a grant for him to go to, uh, to Cornell and teach. Uh, and then uh, when he did talk about the things that he was interested in, they called him an atheist. So these, these powerful words will start to come back and see how can you address a common ground when you're called something that narrows you down. Um, he left Cornell and um, came down to Columbia, where he became um, professor of political and social ethics. And you wonder where social ethics is these days at the university and which department it resides in. Um, we have a department of politics, but is social ethics uh, somewhere represented in your curriculum? Um, he expressed at New in New York the need for a religion without the trappings of ritual or creed that united mankind in moral social action to do away with the theology and to unite theists, atheists, agnostics, and deists, all in the same religious cause. So he certainly thought of it as a religion. Now, people often come into the ethical society, and the last thing they're looking for is a new religion. They left that, and they're glad they left it. But he certainly saw it as a religion, and he saw it as a common quest of various ways that people have come up with to unify forces to do something in the world. It was revolutionary at that time. It turns out, in some regards, it's still revolutionary. The notion that you can do away with, you can uh, bring all these people together and have some common cause. But we do occasionally work at that and make some attempt. Again, he emphasized deed. This is all in discussion at the, uh, in his talks. He would give a lecture every Sunday morning. Uh, they met Sunday morning. It was just like any other religion. They met on Sunday morning, and they would have a lecture uh, instead of a sermon. Uh, but they did not have the rituals that would be, uh, they did not have candles. And, in, and some of the ethical societies wrestle, should we have candles or not have candles? Does it, does it say too much? Uh, what other kinds of traditional ritual do you have? Um, but he then, when he talked about deed, not creed, he got into doing things. So they started something called the district nursing department. If you know anything about that, that became what is now the visiting nurses my brother is a, a director in New York and Queens of the visiting nurses, and um, they provide nursing support all over the metropolitan area. It's the single one of the single largest medical organizations providing care primarily in homes. Um, he also was very much interested in education and developed uh, first free kindergarten. Rich people always had schools. He developed a free kindergarten for working people. Uh, and um, provided all the basic necess necessities. That became the ethical culture of S Fieldston School. It's essentially the first parochial school within ethical culture, and it's on the Upper West Side on 65th Street, uh, right off Central Park, Central Park West. Um, he looked for um, various uh, avenues well beyond um, immediate family. Uh, he, he really thought we had to reform institutions, schools, and government to promote greater justice in human relations. So he thought you work institutionally, individually and institutionally, and that cooperation in, in order to accomplish that. So the notion of getting numbers together. And he had uh, entree to people who had substantial influence. Um, he had entree to all of the uh, um, major players in New York City. When he uh, wanted to start the Fieldston School, he called John D. Rockefeller and invited Rockefeller to come over to his office, which he did. And he told them about his idea to have uh, a school. And he described the school, and Rockefeller said, well, I'll have to have some analysis done of that. He had some analysis done of that. And then he gave $250,000 in, in the late 1800s. And they started the Fieldston School with those dollars. Um, so he had, he, had the he had the ear of people who had both money and power within the city. And as you'll see, uh, he became involved in many, many, he and others in the ethical society. Um, he was very much interested in child labor. Um, one of the major accomplishments early in the mid-1800s was to um, raise the minimum age for workers from 8 to 10. 
Uh, we have an issue uh, 10 years of age that is, uh, it turns out you could work in factories and you only had to be eight for a while. They got it raised to 10. And he worked on uh, these labor issues. It turns out that it, when you read that history, it's a little bit like reading the history, the stories now about immigrants taking over the work of, um, of Americans here. Uh, it turns out kids were taking over the work of their dads and their mothers because they would work for much less than their fathers. Uh, and they got, he worked with uh, labor committees uh, and groups to get that age constantly raised up. He, were, he uh, uh, served on a group that became the American Civil Liberties Union, so the notion of human liberties and, and human rights, um, as well as uh, he was on the first executive board of the National Urban League, which is the urban league that we know today. Um, he was involved in housing, in tenement housing, and, and, and they actually went and built, uh, got money together and built new houses that provide low-rent housing. Um, he also addressed some issues of, of foreign policy. He was not as active in that, but he recognized that even then uh, we had, uh, he thought, an imperialistic rather than democratic goal in uh, foreign policy. And it's in, in affirming the supreme worth of each person he recognized the same thing for countries. He said, you know, they have value in and of themselves. We don't have all the answers and suggested, uh, and we, we've come to know that unless you have some realistic appreciation of another country, your ability to influence the course of events there uh, often goes awry. Um, he really thought the arms race and, uh, was a problem. He actually proposed something um, almost akin to uh, the UN. Uh, uh, something like 100 years earlier than the UN was established. The notion of parliament of parliaments uh, elected by legislative bodies of each of the different nations. He, he thought that uh, nationalism was uh, rather destructive and that if people could work, if countries could work together, they might be able to accomplish something much more productive. He was very much concerned about sectarianism and nationalism. Um, and um, clearly the UN was established in, in that very notion um, and continues to struggle to be effective to overcome some of those um, national barriers. Um, the ethical culture movement was open to people of all faiths. You could come in and be a Catholic, a Jew, a Protestant, a Muslim, whatever. It did not say you could not be a member, and we continue that tradition. Um, there were several uh, societies after New York that were formed, including Chicago, Philadelphia, St. Louis, and a number of other major, mostly in big cities. Um, and also in a variety of uh, cities in, on the continent, London, Vienna, uh, and Berlin. Um, and they were very active as well. Um, interestingly, the humanistic movement has, has grown even more dramatically in, uh, in Europe, particularly in the Scandinavian countries, than ha it has here. Um, his odd uh, uh, philosophy, as we said, derived partly from um, Kant uh, and he, he especially, especially prized public works, this notion of that you can become active in the use of reason uh, to develop ultimate standards uh, was considered a radical notion, uh, using reason rather than received wisdom. Uh, and these are some of the folks that we've talked about. Interestingly, in that time, of course, um, um, Das Kapital came out, and um, Adler was well familiar with, um, with Marx's notions and there were some aspects of socialism that were clearly an element of what was being promoted within um, the ethical movement because it was felt that there was a dramatic, even as much as today, there was a very dramatic imbalance in the distribution of resource, of wealth. And, and that was seen as, as an evil. Uh, and you saw the, pic the earliest picture of uh, Dante's Inferno that shows the fourth level, which was occupied by bankers. And uh, I'm not sure where people would put them today, but um, they had these large bags of gold that were pulling them down deeper and deeper. And that continues to be an issue that we have not made great progress. We've made some progress, perhaps. Uh, he believed that the notion of a personal god was unnecessary. He was not somebody who was beating the drum against, but he did not think it was necessary. And he believed that um, religions were, should be respected as religious in themselves and leave them where they are. He actually thought they would wither 
uh, as uh, others had thought capitalism would wither, uh, he, had th he had thought that religions would wither. Many, many uh, people in that movement, in the, in the progressive movement, thought religions would die of their own weight. Um, it's not so obvious th these days. Um, I want to turn now to, uh, so that's a background on, on where ethical culture started. I want to turn to humanism and talk about it a little bit. And, um, and those two veins came together, and they're very much more explicit. And because it's another 50 years from the founding of ethical culture, the, the terminology is a little bit more modern. But you'll recognize that um, it came out, and there are a variety of threads of this, and I won't tr cover the whole philosophical thread, but I'll just take uh, three markers of, of the, the thread of ideas, and that is the um, humanist manifestos that came out. And you would see these. These are available on, uh, if you simply Google Humanist Manifesto, you'll see these written up in there. There's discussions in there. The first one is, uh, was, came out in, 90, in 1993. And it was signed by several of the leaders within the ethical culture movement, but also by people from some, several other fields. Um, and uh, it, it emphasized that, um, in contrast to the creation notion that um, regard universe as self-existing and not created. Um, I'd like to hear from the uh, astrophysicists who've just found the Higgs boson and see if they have any comment on this. Uh, and also that man is part of nature and he's emerged as a result of a continuing process as opposed to supernatural creation. And uh, other points he emphasized, and I just select a few of these. It asserts that the nature of the universe depicted by modern science makes any unacceptable any supernatural or cosmic guarantees of human values. So again, they're, the humanists tend to come on more strongly, essentially saying religion beliefs, supernatural beliefs, don't have a place. They don't have an impact in the world. Uh, whereas um, Adler was, was not even going to go there. It didn't, he didn't see it necessary as discussing it. And in fact, an ethical culture society rarely spends time talking about God. It's not something that is seen as a productive use of our time, speculating. Um, this, this other emphasis that the humanist finds is religious emotions expressed in a sense of personal life and in a cooperative effort to promote social well-being was the strength that was promoted. Um, and the final one of, the, of manifesto that I just, they assert that humanism will affirm rather than deny life recognize that uh, having grown up as a Catholic, the notion that this life, and Peter would always uh, refer to this, this is only preparation for the long afterlife that we hope, hope to hold, and that this, is, this, really, this life doesn't count other than your ability to get into heaven or hell. I can't say I lived with that continuous fear on, on, in either direction, but there is no question that biologically, uh, there are uh, positive and negative features. That is, we are attracted to positive things and we avoid pain. We, uh, the pledge of pain theory drives an awful lot of behavior on a very immediate basis. Uh, but they, they suggested that, um, that many religions simply reject the value of life. And, and the humanists seek to elicit the possibilities, not flee from them and an endeavor to establish conditions of a satisfactory life for all, not merely for a few. And again, this concept that not just me, not just my family, not just my tribe, but in fact all of us uh, need to work on benefiting everybody else. So you look to the other and say the other is part of us. Um, Humanist Manifesto uh, too came out um, another um, 40, 50 years later in, in 1973. Um, and emphasize religion, ethics, the individual, democratic society, world community, and humanity as a whole, and just take a couple of notes from there. That traditional, dogmatic, or authoritarian religions that pray, uh, place revelation, God, ritual, or creed above human needs do a disservice. So the notion is not just that it's not scientifically accurate, but it may do a disservice. In fact, some of the suggestions is it may lead people to complacency to not be active in trying to change the world but accept it as it is, as it is the design of some creator. Um, and also suggested that uh, accounts of nature should be determined by science, not by uh, traditional, as traditional religions do. And again, they reaffirm moral values derived from human experience. Um, and, and 
in 2003, not that far back, 10 years ago or so, um, Ma Humanist Manifesto 3 came out. And I'm just selecting a little pieces of this. But the point is that it's a progressive philosophy in life that without supernaturalism affirms our ability and responsibility. Here, as opposed to the notion that if you don't have uh, a fear of God or a fear of hell, that uh, you would do all the wrong things. Uh, the notion uh, of humanism and ethical cultures that you have responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good of humanity. So it's a rather grand expectation. Uh, and it's a life stance. Some people say, is it a religion? Other people say, well, it's not a religion. It's my philosophy. It's a, some, uh, the humanists will say it's a life stance guided by reason, inspired by, by compassion, and informed by experience. I take those words very seriously. I think they, may, they mean something to me. The use of reason is something I feel very comfortable. Inspired by compassion is something I, I and, and that you connect not just with the people who are closest with you, but with all of individuals that you encounter. And you attribute worth and dignity to every individual. And it's certainly something that Adler continually emphasized, that within every individual, there are capabilities, skills that could be cultivated, and that's why the term ethical culture, the notion of cultivating ethical behavior in every individual uh, was so prominent. Um, it, it, the uh, Humanist Manifesto ends with a variety of these points and, and brings together several of the points that ethical culture had, and they, they in fact co-published for many years the American Humanist Association and the uh, ethical, the American American Ethical Union, which is the umbrella of all the ethical societies, and the American Humanist Association um, co-published uh, the Humanist magazine. And this is the kind of proposals that came out of it. Um, and essentially that working to benefit societies maximizes individual happiness. It suggests the focus of some of our efforts, some of our values. I would just point out um, some while ago, uh, we used to have a, a hand sheet, the kind that you would go into the voting booth with, and uh, I don't know if Judy is here, but she might recognize this humanist fact sheet. Uh, Dick Carney had, had extracted from some of the uh, humanist manifestos a variety of uh, points so that people know who you are when you walk in. And you know, we have a list over here of who we are, and you might read through that and get a, a, it's Each of these is different from the Ten Commandments, as, as uh, you were introduced to uh, 30 minutes ago. Uh, humanist value ethics and rational, humane, and independent thinking, respect for diverse cultures of the world, a scientific uh, understanding, the right to differ and disagree uh, with courtesy, as you might hope, um, and uh, human achievements in the arts to encourage ethical behavior and critical thinking, lifelong learning. Um, of the many books that um, are, uh, Felix Adler wrote, there are a couple of points that I just pull out that I, I give you some emphasis, that there shall be unity of effort, even if you come in from different perspectives. Um, ethical can gives in, should be engaged in ceaseless efforts at moral imp uh, improvement. Uh, by moving upward, we, re we acquire faith in an upward movement. With it. it was truly an idealistic notion. The question is, can we make ideals real, or what, it, what is the practicality of where we go with any of these? Um, and again, uh, the origin of things we know nothing. Again, we'll defer to the astrophysicist. And can know nothing. So um, it, it, it did perhaps recognize some limits of science. Uh, but perfection does not reveal itself to us as existent in the beginning, but is something that is and ought to be something which we are to help create. Somehow the destinies of the universe depend on our exertions. The notion that we influence it, uh, certainly the people who are interested in global warming are concerned that our exertions are, are creating problems. Uh, the notion that they could be the solution uh, by some different effort might be uh, worth considering. Um, in another book he said, today the estimation, in the estimation of many, science and art are taking the place of religion. Is science and art, is that your religion? Uh, but science and art are inadequate. We need a clearer understanding of applied ethics and a finer and surer tact, moral tact, into the specific duties of life. Where do they come from? He had one simple sta statement that uh, we rely on uh, quite often. 
uh, uh, that he put in the ethical philosophy of life, a supreme ethical rule, act so as to elicit the best in others and thereby in thyself. Uh, and you'd recognize a variation on the golden rule, and it's something that has a very powerful impact if it were put into place. And when we put it into place in our lives, it has, I think, a positive impact in many ways. Um, at the 75th anniversary of the Ethical Culture Society, uh, founded by Adler in New York, uh, Felix Adler spoke. Uh, and he, he, he recognized that um, there was an overemphasis on, he was, of course, uh, had an impact on science and our thinking in math. And he thought there was an overemphasis on that. He said, the dangers which technical progress has directed confront him as of the stifling mutual human considerations by a matter of fact of habit of thought which has come to lie like a killing frost upon human relations. The frightful dilemma of the political world situation has much to do with this sin of omission on the part of our civilization. Without ethical culture, there is no salvation for humanity. Um, Einstein said, if I were a member of any religion, it would be ethical culture. But he didn't feel the need to join a group. The ethical culture society functions as a congregation, as a group of people who come together, not just ideas that are in our head, come together to support one another and to carry out our activity. Um, Adler suggested that no one, and I'd ask you to comment on your perspective on this, no one can fail to see that the power of the church among large numbers in many communities is today diminishing or has already ceased. What do you think? Has religion uh, ceased? Uh, well, um, I joined the society about 40 years ago, and this society, and um, I have no trouble uh, talking to people here or in my neighborhood or in, the, in my work about that, and I have no trouble talking to my parents, who are now, my dad's 98, my mom's 93, about that. And... Uh, about what we do and what we believe. And uh, one day somebody here said, how do your parents feel about um, what you do and what you believe? So uh, I went to my mom. I'm one of seven kids. Uh, that's my dad uh, in front of us. And um, Henry over on the left, on, on your left is, uh, you may have met a few of them. Henry is uh, a director of the uh, Visiting Nurses in New York. Claire is uh, what they call a community organizer on the south side. She lives on Halstead and 52nd Street, if you know the neighborhood. Uh, next is Chris. Uh, my brother Chris um, ran for uh, Congress. He's uh, um, an organizer for the Socialist Workers Party. Um, my sister Claire in the middle is um, runs a, a daycare center out in California. Uh, I'm, I'm here, and uh, my sister Eileen, and uh, next over is, um, does health care work in uh, London, Talk about health care systems around the world. She has people coming from uh, many parts of Africa who are dealing in projects um, on health care delivery throughout that region. Um, my brother uh, Raymond is uh, a retired fireman fire lieutenant from New York City, uh, following in the footsteps of my dad. So I asked my mom, what do you think of all this? And she said, well, you all follow the Beatitudes. Well, I hadn't heard that word in probably 20 years, the Beatitudes. I don't know how many of you know the Beatitudes. And it goes a little bit like this. It's um, said to be uh, uh, something that was written, um, I think, in stone on the Sermon on the Mount, uh, some of the words of uh, translated by uh, St. Matthew. Uh, and something along the lines of, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, but then I go into the others. Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the land. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they shall have their fill. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And blessed are those that suffer persecution for justice sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Um, 
the notion that you come back to where you were in interesting ways is what I'd suggest. And I, I speak with Joanne, I say, you know, how would our life be different? You don't know, but I carry with me most of the values that I grew up with. The reason I do the things I do are not motivated by the same things that motivated me many years ago. But I feel comfortable in both homes. Not that I would say the same words or attribute my actions to supernatural notions, but to the extent that they motivate behavior that I feel very comfortable with and appropriate, I have no trouble saying, this is good. And uh, the heavens have many faces. This is um, one of those that we had a chance to celebrate, a wedding of my nephew that Joanne and I officiated at, where um, all of my family would have participated. And uh, the heavens, uh, it had been raining all morning, of course, and the heavens opened up. And uh, the wedding took place out on the beach on uh, the Jersey Shore. Uh, so the point is that um, I think you can um, make changes in your life, identify ch places in which those changes take place that are significant for you, and see what you hold on to, and that there are core values that I think Adler had a great truism, and that is that there is so much central, so much of a common ground that we can share, that we should work at sharing that common ground. And then... Um, we certainly have lots of hard work to deal with how, the, how we will deal with differences, but the much harder work is to work together on those areas that we all see a need for, uh, both social and economic justice. Um, so I'd like to stop and invite you to ask questions, but I'll turn the floor over first to Sue. Thank you. Thanks. That was uh, very helpful because it helped me reconcile something I've always wondered about. Can you put Dick Carney's slide back up? Yes. Um, the first time I found out about what this group was about, it was reading the fact sheet that we used to have up on our website. I think it's still there. Um, if you look at the last bullet, the way that Dick put it, mm -hmm. I see it as being fundamentally different than Adler. Um, and I know this wasn't an accident because I actually talked to Dick about it. Notice it doesn't say uh, the fundamental dignity exists unconditionally. It calls on people to accept responsibility and accountability. And I see, I've always thought that this Adler thing about um, there's uh, good in everybody or, or inherent worth or whatever you want to call it was just as mystical as believing in God. Dick you know, switch the presumption there to say, you know, probably it's there uh, if you play by the rules, but you don't have to respect all these sociopaths and others and just say we should pour unending effort into trying to connect to these people and waste our time trying to salvage these people. So I'm curious if you are more comfortable with the way Dick put it or you really think we should be trumpeting Adler. I think Adler is a dead end on this, and in fact it makes us look actually quite bad when, you, when others hear that, it sounds incredibly naive, whereas I think this is more responsible and sounds more like what I think most of us uh, actually practice. Um, the timing of your question is perfect, both in, in not just in this particular talk, but um, about three or four weeks ago, uh, my daughter Amy and I were in uh, Albany at the national meeting of the American Ethical Union. And the focus of that meeting was on um, criminal justice. And um, we would meet in various small groups of uh, half a dozen, dozen people discussing one topic or another. And um, at every one of those small groups were people who um, had done hard time in Sing Sing. Albany is just a few miles away from Sing Sing. And um, what you suggest is what effort we should put into individuals to find what core kernel there might be that might be worth promoting. And uh, I must say, when we first went off to that particular meeting, uh, we were, had not focused on that at all. Criminal justice had not been a focus that I had or Amy had been involved in. We were dumbstruck by um, 
what these folks had to say who had done 20 or 30 years in Sing Sing, who had been involved, who, who had, had made bad choices and could be in one of the categories that you described that you could say a loser in one regard or another. And um, they were people who were promoting education within Sing Sing because, and within other, the prison system and, and the entire criminal justice system because you may know the government no longer feels it's, it's cost effective to provide that. I, I am convinced that within each individual there is that capability. I think it's actually a matter of triage. Is what resources are you going to uh, put to bear to bring out that strength that each individual had? Uh, Adler, of course, uh, was starting out with having uh, a level of squalor in New York and recognized that people were not provided education or other resources and thought that if you provided education, and he valued education more than any religious group that I know of, and thought that this was what would bring out that strength, that there are diminishing returns or there are people that will not have a yield uh, if you make that effort. Uh, I don't argue against it. I think uh, it's, uh, it, there may be practicality issues. We might, as you know, we might welcome, our, open our doors to all and be, have such a disruptive meeting. In fact, it brings to mind um, uh, an event that uh, 10 or 20 of you who are here now were present. We opened the floor, as you know, for a talk right here, and we had a man who came in with um, a top hat, and he had um, an American flag draped around his shoulders, and he stood right up here, and he lambasted the entire audience, and he was going on and ranting and raving and telling them how they should live. And uh, I happened to be in the back. Uh, Sue Burke, who was behind me, pushed me up and said, Tom, do something. Because <laughs> everybody in the audience was going to kill him. They were literally going to get up and, and kill him. And I never saw this audience so riled. And I, I, I walked up and I said to him, sir, would you say what you want to say and then pass on the mic? And he spoke for about 10 seconds and then passed on the mic. So I, 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 he was clearly disturbed in some significant way. I think there is a kernel that we can cultivate and bring out in everybody, and the issue is what efforts are we prepared to make to do that? Okay, you come. Thank you. Um, I found your lecture really good, and I related to a lot of what you said. Um, you started out with me? <laughs> well, um, I'm actually a recovered Pentecostal apostolic faith, so yeah. that's like fundamentalist type stuff, yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm college educated very experienced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm, enough about myself. What I found really interesting was the point about Copernicus and how it shifted from us being the center to outward. And it sounds like when you were talking about your journey, you know, when you and your wife first got together and you as an individual, as a young man, it was very much about you being the center. And when it came time to raise children, it, you know, gradually radiated out. And now in this stage of your life, it's about beyond you and the community and mm -hmm. society and things like that. So, so how has the society in its 100 plus years helped people kind of make that transition? I'm kind of at the midpoint, you know, I have children, I'm moving on with my life, I'm in a lot of change, but I'm trying to do things beyond myself. Absolutely, that's the, that's the, that's the big ethical step. So, is, is you start out, obviously biologically, we're there for our own survival and you do those things that help you survive. And um, we recognize that kids do that. They just need to be feed, fed and, wet and, and changed and, and the basic biological issues. And we, we live with a concern for ourselves. At what point do we make an ethical step that there's concern for others? I consider it an intellectual step because I think it's not, I don't think it's biological. I think when it happens, our own self-interest and our own tribes work to support us. And the point that I think is an intellectual step, and it's the, the reach that uh, Adler made, is, is what I call um, informed self-interest. Once we realize that it's not safe for me here today unless it's safe for everybody, I can, I can go to some part of the city and feel perfectly safe in another part of the city, not feel so safe, then unless I'm involved in that, it's, I, I would just, I, I think it is as a, a rational decision to take it beyond my biological need. I could stay in this circle, which is what most tribes do and most religions do. You stay in the circle and you're safe. So I think it is an intellectual decision that is an informed self-interest that I've got to make the world better for myself and obviously for my kids and my grandkids. Yeah. Please. 
Um, I, I very much enjoyed your lecture. I just have a few questions. So um, I have been an atheist. Not that, like that matters, but I'm very um, interested in psychology. And I'm wondering how psychology kind of ties in. I know you guys are, sci you know, you base a lot of things on science. You have ethics, you have humanity, and how, how do you perceive um, psychology of people? One, one of the things that I'm quite curious about is people like Hobbes, they claim that we are driven totally by um, selfish interests, that you're only kind of concerned about yourself. Is that something that um, Adler would claim that that's something we can overcome, but that still exists in us, or does, does he never make a mention and that never comes up? Absolutely, he does, and uh, it taps right into my background. I'm a, a, a neuroscientist, and in fact, I work on the brain, and one of the major focuses I work on is fear. And how does fear, and, and you may know that fear is learned. It's a psychological phenomenon that's learned. No, but a, a baby doesn't know fear. They get hurt, and then they know fear. You learn from experience. You learn fear from experience. No, uh, Adler would be well aware of the biological drives. In fact, um, that's if you look at, at, at the, the first things that I was showing that show, show all these prayers, the, the Ten Commandments, they recognize these biological drives. And they're biological and psychological, whether it's food, sex, or uh, uh, water, all of the temperature, all of these things that are biologically driven. Um, obviously, we unless unless we have some way of uh, dealing with them in uh, at a higher level, they would overcome us as they uh, as obesity does, for instance. If we if we evolved in a setting in which there was some level of scarcity, so that our body needs craves salt and sugar, we have if we have no control over that, then we don't eat salt and sugar till we die, which is what happens. Obesity and cardiac disease and stroke kill most of us. So some blends of that. So the notion that uh, Adler recognized that we must develop a higher, he talked about higher levels of thinking that have to overcome um, biological uh, drives. That are, uh, biological drives are almost short, always short-lived. Short that, um, that is their, the first thing you do. And the issue of delayed gratification is the kind of thing that you'd end up with, whether it's for food or various other rewards. So he would be very much attuned to the notion that we need to think about human nature, work within the constraints. Uh, and there's no question you have to work within the constraints of human nature, but recognize that biology drives so much behavior that unless you have a way of acknowledging that, I mean, how many different diet programs have you ever heard of? They're all attempts to overcome a biological, psychological drive. And some people succeed. We have people who came in last week and you lost 30 pounds. That's, that's overcoming a biological drive to eat the food we see. Right? Um, Anil, Anil was just commenting on wording. And yeah. um, I, I've heard we need to act so as to bring out the best in others. But as, as Adler worded it, we need to act to elicit the best in others and therefore in ourselves. And to me, that's so different. The first statement seems to imply that other people need to be better, and the other includes us in it. And it, it just seems to me we all need to be better. Um, that's a real good point. Um, early on, there were concerns that um, Adler was expressing um, so much righteousness uh, and as the notion that I have the right ideas that um, he was severely, separate from his notions that he was being criticized as an atheist, the notion of, of self-importance and being, uh, having the right answers was certainly concerned. And he addressed those and, and acknowledged that, in fact, um, what science would tend to bring to bear is the recognition of our, uh, uh, of our inadequacy in so many settings. So many of the things that he had attempted to do, he failed at. He attempted to organize um, when people had gone on strike in a, in a setting in New York, he arranged for them to be able to buy the business and then run the business. And he thought, oh, people's ownership of the business. And it certainly came out of some of the socialist and communist ideas that were extant at the time. And um, it turned out that people ran the business for a little while. And then when they got a, a, so a better uh, salary somewhere else, they went off. So. Um, he, he came to be much, uh, very humble and, and, in fact, 
when ethical culture and ethical humanism are termed about, I, I show you the history and show you a picture here, but in fact you don't see pictures adorning the walls of such people. So um, I think there was a humility of um, the task is so great that for any of us to have the presumption that we have the answers, and every one of these, I, I don't, obviously I'd be very selective here, but every one of the, the groups, both the humanists and the ethical culture folks, saw this as we don't have the wisdom. We have some collective ideas about what the good is, but we have lots more to learn and learn how, I mean, think, excuse me, think about this, the, the most, one of the common institutions of marriage, how little we know about how to do that. And he had written a number of uh, lectures on, on just that, and they recognize how, how weak we are in developing the science of relating to one another. So I think there was humility there, not just that it's the other people who have to be brought along. I think this talk was so beautiful in articulating who we are. Mm -hmm. um, I'm often in groups that are skeptical, secular, atheists, and when they find where I spend my Sundays, they say things like, oh, well, if you're the ethical humanists, what does that make us? <laughs> and, oh, you all are so religious. And when I'm feeling defensive and challenged, I'm not at my most articulate. And, but as I said to John, um, your talk and his talk are so dense with information, I can't get it at one exposure, and it would be such a great tool. So if I could be emailed the um, PowerPoint. Sure. <laughs> I, I just say I should, I introduced this in part, I was asked because uh, a couple of months ago, Nancy Kaufman, who has uh, joined the society a few, uh, uh, a year or two ago, said, you know, I came in because I was interested in being with the, some of the ideas and the people that I met, but I really don't know what it's all about. And it is worth looking at these and, and deciding what those initial inspirations were and how they've been modified to some extent over time. Yeah. And, and and challenged, if they have not been successful, I have to assert that the numbers are about 2,000 in this country of people who would be members of ethical societies. It's a very level, a very modest level of success, but if you look at the institutions that exist in government and in, in several other settings, some of those are the manifestations of these ideas. So there's certainly, we don't ha drive that force, but uh, there are directions that we can assess whether we're making any progress. Yeah, please. Tom, this is so wonderful, thank you. Um, as you know, I've been involved in this from, from birth, mm -hmm. and what I've seen my whole life is just why can't we get the good news out? You know, um, it seems that, I mean, while I have, I was taught in Sunday school to respect all religions and um, I see there's a lot of good and a lot of positive messages. What I do see that they have that we don't have is threats and fear. And I want to know if you have any thoughts on how do we spread the news without the, the threat of eternal damnation and all, all, the, all, those, all those sexy things that, that make people afraid and also comforted because they're, set, they're told, you know, this will happen to you if you do wrong, but if you do right, we give you this. What, do, what can we offer to counteract fear? We, all these things on this piece of paper are very positive. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's a tough one. No, on the contrary. I think um, even though when, when we asked that question, I asked the question because uh, Adler had asserted that religion is disappearing. Um, I think we had, uh, standing up here, somebody who was making a point uh, from Common Ground a while ago. He said, when, um, when a group is threatened with extinction, it fights even more vigorously than it ever did. I happen to have the same view that, um, that Adla had, and, uh, and that's been promoted by Common Ground, and that is there is an enormous Common Ground. Governments are working towards it. What we're seeing in, in parts of North Africa, we, we suspect, and the Middle East might have some elements of that. How it all plays out is not clear. I don't think it's a matter of how many people are in the room that make, that make it count. Uh, it's the impact on society. I actually think the threats that um, in the Nixon days they used to say, you know, the secular humanists are taking over the world and our schools and this and that. Actually, I think if you look at what hap has happened, 
I mean, the notion of democracy, does anybody question democracy that you know of? Well, that was a, a radical notion. The notion of collective decision making. Uh, when, when we talked about uh, Copernicus, the, the other notion besides the, the planets being different from the way the heavens were and thought to be organized, the notion that there was not a, ki a god or a king. Kings, do you know any kings anymore? So I think we're winning. The issue is they don't have to come in here to be part of that. I think recognizing the, the kinds of changes that have happened. When, when Adler was dealing with labor issues, kids, there was not a, a, a 40 hour week. They had 10 year olds who were in sweatshops. So I think we don't, we don't even think of that as progress because it's so far back, 100 years. So I think um, we'd like to see women in, being able to be in schools in some parts of, the, parts of the world. But in this country, in my school, there are as many women who are going to be doctors as men. That wasn't the case when I started 40 years ago at the same university. So I, I guess I, I don't worry about not having an impact. I think they're inexorable changes. I actually think they're not, there's no question. The issue is we have a hard time cooperating. That's, I think that's a human challenge. Families can cooperate sometimes. Um, but in fact, people don't cooperate very well. We need to develop better skills of cooperation.